a series, series of online academic lectures for old members run by the development team. The series aims to highlight the diverse and world-leading research that is happening at Worcester College and is part of old members' events programme, which include a wide selection of in-person events, um, where the development team regularly welcomes you back into college for Gaudi's subject dinners, garden days, and other topical events. Um, you can find more information on the back of the Worcester magazine, and all old members are invited to join any college events by email. I'm particularly pleased to be able to introduce Dr. John Parrington, whose lecture this evening is entitled Human Consciousness versus Artificial Intelligence. How similar are they and are computers and robots about to take over the world? Dr. Parrington is an associate professor in cellular and molecular pharmacology and a fellow and tutor in physiological sciences at Worcester. He's recently been appointed as the Joint Head of Research at Worcester. He's the author of two books on consciousness, the most recent entitled Consciousness, How Our Brain Turns Matter Into Meaning, um, was published by Icon Books in October 2023 um, and is available from all good book retailers and hopefully winging its way underneath all your Christmas trees as we speak. His work raises challenging questions about the extent to which AI is capable of approaching human intelligence, mirroring the human brain, or possessing a sense of meaning. Does it have a general intelligence system? So I'm sure with these questions in mind, we're in for an interesting lecture and a lively discussion afterwards. Um, do please use the chat button at the bottom of your screens to post questions throughout the talk. Um, I'll pick up as many as possible and arrange them into groups, and we can use those to structure a conversation with John um, after he's spoken to us. So over to you, John. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I'll just try and share my screen. Hopefully this is going to work. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Um, should be able to see the first slide hopefully yeah so it's uh, obviously a very topical question i was reading two articles in the newspaper today about ai one about self-driving cars another one about this new rival to chat gpt and a lot of talk about you know whether hu uh, computers are on the verge of somehow approaching something like a human intelligence and whether we should be particularly worried about this uh certainly this is a rather menacing image isn't it of, of a computer god knows what it's up to uh the world but what, what it's up to and of course we've seen films like Terminator, which which basically predict the worst. Um, so what I wanted to do is, I, I, of course, there's all sorts of ways to approach this, this topic. And I particularly wanted to do so through my interest in human consciousness and what we can say about the material basis of human consciousness. Because I believe we need to think carefully about what we mean by our own consciousness before we can start predicting how a, a computer might somehow mimic that or even surpass it. So as a biologist, I'm particularly interested in the role that biology plays in, in our minds, in how our brains work. But I'm also very aware of the, the role of the environment. I think that our social environment has a huge impact to play uh, in our behaviour and making us the individual people that we are. So what kind of choices we're making in life. Of course, that raises all sorts of questions about free will versus determinism and all sorts of, of fascinating questions. And one of the things that really got me interested in the whole question of uh, well, thinking about human consciousness and what might make it so different from that of animals was thinking about human evolution. Uh, it was actually an essay I, I read when I was still an undergraduate uh, uh, by a person called Friedrich Engels. Now, you may have come across Engels, I'm sure, in the context of someone who was a political activist and thinker. But he was also very interested in science. Actually, they say one of the most well-read uh, uh, people of his day in terms of new scientific uh, discoveries and ideas. And what Engels did, and I think the fossil record has basically proven him correct, really, was to predict the pattern of human evolution in a way that somehow Darwin didn't, didn't really quite grasp in the same way. So what Engels said in his essay that unfortunately was, was more or less buried after that, and very people have, have, have really even heard of it, was um, to say that what happened with human evolution was their ancestors, their ape like ancestors, somehow they came down from the trees, ended up on the savannah, probably due to some climatic change that we think may have happened at the time in the, in the east of Africa. And this then led to an important new change, which was that our ancestors started walking on two legs for the first time. Now, this, according to Engels, then opened up 
another possibility, which was that they had hands that they had no longer needed to use to walk around on. And this then led to the development of, 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 of tool use. So humans became a species that tools became a key part of their lives. Now, we're not the only species that can use tools. There are examples of, say, chimpanzees using sticks in a tool-like manner. There are even some birds, crows, that can use tools in quite a sophisticated fashion. But what I would argue is very different about human beings is that only we use tools in this systematic way. Just think about what you may have um, had for lunch. You, you use a, a, a fork, knife and fork, or, or chopsticks, or whatever people use to, to eat their lunch with to, to eat that meal. But I'm also using a tool to communicate with you today. I'm, I'm talking through this computer, and obviously we, we're talking about very advanced technology uh, compared to the simple sticks that, that people may have first used, to, you know, uh, as spears back in our um, prehistoric days. But they're still equally tools. And I think the other major thing that's important about us as a species in terms of tool use is we are continually developing using new tools. And, and of course, this is this trend has accelerated in modern times to the extent it can be quite bewildering keeping up with the latest apps and technologies. Certainly my kids, I think, uh, often know much more about these technologies than I do because and I, and we can come on to talk about why that is. Another important thing happened then when people started to use tools, and that was that language then came on the scene and, and as Engels put it for the first time human beings had something to say to each other and I think importantly what was happening when people were starting to use tools was they were doing this in a in a, in a social way they were working with each other you can see why Engels is stressing this point but they were working together in in, 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 a, in a social way and that led then to the impetus for them to start exchanging uh, ideas now again we're not the only species on earth that and communicate via sounds. What I believe is very different about human language is that only humans can talk in terms of a series of abstract, a system of abstract symbols joined together by grammatical rules that allows us to rep to, to put, uh, allows us to uh, talk about things like past, present, and future, location, distance ourselves versus others these are all concepts so only we i would argue have this conceptual thinking that's based on, on language and and then to cap it all what then started to happen as we started to use these tools to transform the world around us and also to develop language was that our brains be began to expand in a very dramatic way so the human brain is around three times the size that you would expect uh, for a, a primate of our of our, of our size um, so that was a big change. And I would also argue, and that's what I've argued in my book, that structural changes and quite fundamental changes began to take place uh, in the brain. And in fact, um, th this is something we can now think a bit more about in terms of how that affects the, you know, the way the brain works. Now, the other set of people who got me really thinking about uh, human consciousness and what might make it different from other people was a couple of intellectuals, thinkers who... Um, put forward their ideas after the Russian, in Russia in the 1920s and 30s, somebody called Levigotsky, who was a psychologist, and Vol Valentin Voloshinov, um, who was a philosopher of language. And both of them, I think, really picked up on this um, way of looking at language as a very uh, specific way of structuring thought. So Vygotsky was very interested in the link between thought and language. He studied this in children and he showed how concepts develop, for instance, during childhood. But Voloshinov, very interested in language as a dialogue. And what they both, I think, seized upon was the fact that there is a real sense in which language in the form of inner speech plays a very important role in structuring our thoughts in a way that we don't have in other species. And importantly, this is seen as a dialogue. So although we might think of our thoughts as being very much us as an individual, what's really happened as we develop uh, is, is that uh, from, from, through childhood, is that our thoughts themselves uh, start to take on the, the hues of, of society. So what we learn from our carers, our parents, our peers, all has an Im impact on the way that our thought then develops. So to think of it in a dialogic way, um, I believe is a very important way of looking at uh, the way the brain works and the way the thought works in the brain. But importantly, we still have to then situate all this within what's going on in an individual biological brain. And this is where I thought I could maybe add something to what had been said about um, consciousness by people like Vygotsky and Bloshner, because sadly they died um, quite young, both of them, uh, uh, 
um, Vygotsky died of tuberculosis when he was in his late 30s in 1934. Around the same time, Valentin Voloshinov died, uh, even more tragically, in a, not from a disease, but from being locked up in one of uh, Stalin's gulags. So the, the tide was really starting to turn in the Soviet Union that time against the sort of creativity that you got with people like Vygotsky and Voloshinov and the later uh, kind of Stalinist regime. Anyway, the point was is that they both died almost 100 years ago. So what I thought I would try and do in my books, in my last book, um, Consciousness and, and before that, Mind Shift, is to start thinking of how modern neuroscience and psychology might inform some of these ideas about the importance of language. And, and I would also say tool use and technology in, in the evolution of, of the human consciousness. And so what I've been doing in the books is really to look at new discoveries in neuroscience and thinking, well, what are we learning about how the brain works, not just of animals, but also the human brain. And that's obviously challenging, the kind of things we can do with the human brain and experiments compared to obviously animal studies. But what we're starting to learn is some really quite, I think, quite fundamental things. And this is hopefully will prove relevant to what I'm going to talk about later on in terms of artificial intelligence. So there is a kind of sim has been a simplistic idea of the brain as being essentially an electrical circuit. It's essentially lots of neurons joined together, and that's essentially how the brain works. And there's definitely a truth to that, that the kind of electrical activity in neurons is incredibly important to how the brain works. But we're also starting to realise there's another class of cells in the brain, the glial cells, that at one time were thought to be just a passive support for neurons. And, and yet what we're actually finding out is they play all sorts of important roles in, in the brain and how it works. The other thing I think that's really changing our view of how the brain works is that far from seeing the genome as just being this passive, this, 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 as it's sometimes called a blueprint and everything, all the information is somehow read off the genome. We're starting to realize that all sorts of sophisticated changes can happen uh, to not just the DNA, uh, but also the proteins associated with that. We're also starting to realize that RNA plays very important roles uh, in, in how, how genes are switched on or off and, and in basically how the whole cell works, which is challenging this, this idea that there's a sort of a, a simple kind of code there that's being read off and importantly we're also starting to realize just how important the environment is in, in affecting the, the the way that the this genome works and that's very true of, of brain cells as, as much as other cells as well i think another real sea change and something i really have, have developed uh, quite a bit in the book is what i see is a real change in the way we view how the brain works and this is based on the fact that far from it just being about neurons joined together in, in, as electric circuits we're also starting to realize there's a more dynamic aspect to how the brain works as a whole and in particular the way that brain waves of different frequencies seem to then play major roles in connecting different parts of the brain now i think this is giving us a sense of how the brain works as a whole as being a much more dynamic dynamic entity and not really just as i said this kind of circuit diagram so that challenges idea that we can kind of think of neurons as say on off switches uh, and, and join together in a linear way. Instead, it says that the whole brain and the way it works is, is more dynamic than that. And I would have thought harder to, to, to model digitally as well. So what have I done with these insights that I've, I've picked up on from, from neuroscience and psychology? Well, what I've tried to do is to then turn that back and say, well, think about you know, thought or memory or creativity, imagination. These are things that are not peculiar to humans. Animals have quite sophisticated thoughts, we believe, memories, Creativity that can be imaginative and creative in ways that I think we're only just starting to realize just how uh, sophisticated um, other animals can be. But what I would argue is this role of language and, and, and also the way that technology affects our society and the way it, 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 we, we communicate with each other has a major impact uh, on, on, on all of these different things. And in particular, even at the most basic molecular and cellular level, we're starting to realize just how much this, this influence of language and, and our technological abilities uh, can affect these processes. Something that I didn't think you could leave out of books about the consciousness is the role of the subconscious or unconscious. Um, to some extent, there's nothing um, controversial about the idea we have a lot of unconscious activity in our brains. Um, I cycle to work today. It's a fairly well-trodden, uh, well, well cycled route that I that I that I get to work on. To some extent, I was it's you know I was obviously I was keeping an eye on the road and all these things. I hope anybody would who's on a bike or a, or a car. But I was also thinking about the talk I was going to give uh, the, the, today. I was thinking about some of the you know work I've been involved in, um, what I was going to have to to eat uh, for dinner uh, tonight, that kind of thing. So there's a whole set of 
th thoughts going on in our head, some of which were more to the forefront or more obvious in the conscious mind, others that will be partially unconscious. And of course, one of the interesting things about being human is the way we can somehow switch from having this unconscious uh, thoughts to, to it suddenly being at the forefront of our mind. Hopefully, if we see someone in front of us on a bike, we will suddenly, that will, you know, get out of automatic mode and, and quickly take action. There is, though, a more controversial aspect to thinking about the unconscious. And this is the one that is more associated with Sigmund Freud, though I'd argue actually the idea of a, an unconscious in the way that Freud talked about goes much further back, back to the, for instance, the Romantics in the 18th century were talking about the importance of the unconscious. Um, in fact, people like um, De Quincey, who actually studied here at Worcester College, was one of the first people in, in, in Britain anyway to, to really talk about the importance of the unconscious. Um, and this is a more, maybe a slightly more subversive way of looking at the unconscious, because it's this idea that while we might think we have a very rational mind and we do, we act in a rational way, actually the unconscious can subvert that and it can act, make us act in and behave in all sorts of ways that you might think go against rationality. And yet at certain times uh, we can be driven by these unconscious desires and, and all those things. And I think that's a very important and, and, and part of consciousness. And what I've tried to do in my books is really then link that with this idea of the importance of language and particularly the idea that uh, there's this dialogue going on in the brain and, and also the idea of inner speech as having different levels uh, and then thinking how that fits with the idea there's an unconscious there that has, you know, to some extent an impact on our minds. Now, to get onto the, the main subject of the talk, artificial intelligence, what I want to do now is to then start thinking, well, how does this relate to claims that computers, systems like ChatGPT, uh, for instance, uh, are somehow showing that computers are getting close to, uh, to some kind of ability to, to, to think like us and maybe even surpass that. Maybe that's you know, potentially a very dangerous thing to let computers develop in this way. Uh, people talk about the singularity, the moment when we, when suddenly we realise that computers can actually think and 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 and, and, and uh, exactly like us, and they're actually then about just about to go beyond that, and it's then obviously it's potentially too late at that point. And what I want to look at is some of the claims that have been made about supposed similarities between the human brain and these uh, AI systems, particularly so-called machine learning systems that are the basis of things like ChatGPT, for instance. Um, so I think one important point to make is that when I was talking earlier on about how thoughts develop in the brain, uh, I think an important point to make there is that we get inputs, sensory inputs from our uh, out, the outside world, don't you know, I mean, at the moment I'm staring at this computer screen. Uh, there's a sense in which our eyes, our ears, all our senses are picking up these uh, information that's coming in from the uh, from the outside world. And yet, in many ways, that's just raw data. There's nothing to say what makes it meaningful. What makes it meaningful, uh, to, to, I believe, for, for us humans, is on the one hand, we've evolved as biological beings to make sense of the world. So you could argue that, you know, my cat uh, is quite capable in that, in that sense of making meaning of the world around her. What I would say is very different about uh, human mind is that where that language then and our conceptual abilities allow us to... Uh, you know, create meaning in a conceptual way from the kind of inputs that are coming into our heads. Now, as far as I can see, there's nothing to, that I've learned about you know, even the most sophisticated computers that says they are somehow aware and making meaning for making from, 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 from what they're taking in. So for a computer, as shown here, you have inputs, you have a data processing unit, and, and that's uh, using that algorithms to then manipulate data that, that's coming in there, all based on programs that have been created by human beings. And you've got memories, so you've got like a data storage that can then feed into that. And then you've got an output, and hopefully that, if it's a well-made computer, that will be a meaningful output to a human being. But there's nothing in the system itself that's somehow aware of what it's doing. So I think that's a very important point to make, because, I, I mean, I've read, for instance, about ChatGPT, People have claimed that through the machine learning process, it's somehow becoming able to under, understand what it's doing. And, and I would challenge that. I think the other important point to make in terms of differences between the human brain and what's uh, supposedly going on, uh, people claim is going on in these neural nets and neural networks, which were the basis of machine learning, is that we're often told that the um, as I've said earlier on, that the, the brain is simply neurons connected together 
uh, in circuits and in a way that stresses the idea that they are on off switches. So it's really just a case of an axon being uh, activated, sorry, a neuron being activated, it's axon then passes on an impulse to the next neuron in the chain. And it's, you could think of these things a bit like a, a digital on off switch. And there is an element of truth to that, that it's, it's based on the inputs that are coming into the axon, to, to the neuron through its dendrites, which is shown here are the inputs for the for the neuron, and, and then you get a signal going through the axon, and there's a certain all or nothing quality to that. But what I would argue is very different is that the more we're learning about the role, for instance, of the genome in um, in the neuron, and also the way that the neuron can develop it in, in a cellular way, we're realizing that it's a massive oversimplification to think it's just kind of an on-off switch. And I've also mentioned the role of the glial cells that play these really important roles in the brain. They're nothing part of this electrical circuitry, but actually do important things uh, in terms of um, neuronal function. And then finally, the role of brain waves, which as I've said, connect bits of the brain together, di completely different parts of the brain together in dynamic ways that goes against this idea that these are just linear circuits, so that's the heart of it all. Now we see here a difference with the neural uh, networks that, that we have in, in say a computer program like uh, ChatGPT, which on the one hand, there is a certain similarity. They can learn in the sense from the, the inputs and the way they kind of train them to respond to different situations. In a way, that's what's happening with ChatGPT. It's looking at massive amounts of information that have been cobbled together by the programmers, and it's then somehow learning from this uh, uh, about what's a normal way of putting together, say, you know, a response to a problem. You know, write me an essay about this poem by. Um, by, uh, by by Sylvia Plath, for instance. I, I tried that with a chat GPT system to see what it came with. And it came up with a, a sort of, you know, there was lots of things lacking, but some kind of vaguely coherent sense of what might be going on in that poem. Now, what I think is very different about these new neural networks, as I've said, is that because they're not really approximating what's actually happening in a brain, and because there's no real sense of that kind of meaning the, the sense of meaning that we get with the human brain, I would argue it's a very different process that's going on there. But I'd be very happy to, very interested to hear what people have got to say about them, the questions people want. Very nice to be challenged on this, really. Um, and I think in general, this idea that we can simply, um, you know, we can talk about a, a machine system, a, a computer system, as the equivalent to the human brain, brain also misses a, a central point, which is that the biology of the human brain is absolutely central to the way that it works. So although I've stressed the role of language and, and somehow you could argue, well, maybe that makes us think of the brain as, a, as like a word processor. Actually, the organic aspect of the brain, the role of neurotransmitters, hormones, the kind of emotions, all these have a massive impact in the way that our consciousness develops. And so when people, for instance, proponents of AI have said that we can disregard the fact that the hardware of a computer is different from what they call the wetware of, 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 the, human, of the human brain, i.e. just the, the, you know, the, the, the neurons, the, the glial cells, whatever. Um, I don't believe it's, it's so easy to just say that you can disregard the, the kind of material basis of those two things. And that's another reason why I'm very skeptical about the idea that at the moment, anyway, these computer systems are somehow um, approximating human consciousness. And I think just to end then, I think one of the, the things to, to, to then think about is, you know, why is it that um, we're in this position where we are, fear, there's a lot of fears out there, and I think justified fears in the sense of we've got to be very careful and very wary about the technologies that we create. But why is it that we see, um, for instance, these computer technologies as a threat in themselves, rather than thinking a bit more about, well, maybe, you know, where they've come from and what they're possible, what they're feasible, what they're capable of doing, but also the kind of human role in all this. Because, you know, one of the things that we can say, I think that's exciting about being a human being, and I mean, very exciting is that, is that with our consciousness, with, with this thing that apparently is about, you know, the weight of a couple of bags of sugar and has the consistency of cold porridge. We've been able to come up with these amazing things in our in our society, going from 50, you know, 40, 50,000 years, we were living in caves and scraps, you know, living from the surface of the earth. And now we're sending rockets, uh, uh, you know, uh, to Mars and beyond. We, we have amazing cities, amazing transport systems. And yet we also are living in a society where we are facing potential ruin and catastrophe. Global warming is just one of the problems we face. The other is extinction of species on a mass scale, um, pollution, all, all these things are major things to be, I think, rightly concerned about. And, 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 and as part of this, I then think we've got to look at the things that we're creating and think, well, you know, where are we heading with this? And now I think there's an interesting thing going on here, which is that we may 
um, sometimes assume that it's this, it's a tool itself, the technology we're creating that them, that themselves are the problem. And I think that to some extent explains why this idea that really it's the computers that are about to take over and destroy us all and not thinking carefully about the way we use these technologies and, and the human kind of aspect of all this. And, and certainly, I mean, at the moment, there's all sorts of, I think, quite justified concerns about the spread of these machine learning systems. I, I would certainly be worried if, you know, if I was in a job where, maybe that these computers to to some extent approximate you know a pretty badly written newspaper article or uh, apparently they're even talking about computers that can mark an essay i would hope my marking would would sort of match up to anything that a computer would do but who knows in the future but but i think we do it then after then separate that from this idea that it's the computers themselves that are somehow uh, responsible for this and in a kind of thinking meaningful way i mean at the moment obviously there's some horrendous you know wars taking place around the world there's drones being used to you know, so so destruction on people. At the end of the day, although those are very sophisticated computer systems that are behind those things, it, it's people that are responsible for these for for, for designing and, and using these things. And I think that's where it ends really, which is that exciting though it is the way that we've used our technology to transform the world. I think we do need to step back and think how we might try try and do things in a more ethical, sustainable way. And that means means on the one hand, I think being absolutely clear about what what the basis for these technologies that we're creating. And I think that's hopefully what I've been trying to do today, but also then think about how we can now use them in a more positive and, and productive way than some of the ways that technologies get misused and abused. And I think I'll leave it there. So thank you for listening to my introduction. Oh, thank you very much, John. That was uh, that, that was tremendous. And I, I, I've learned a lot, not least the cold porridge analogy for the human brain, which as, as a squeamish historian is making me quite slightly. Um, I'll, I'll um, maybe leave a couple of minutes for um, the chat and the Q&A sessions to, to populate as, as the audience has a, um, a chance to digest what you said um, and perhaps invoke chair's privilege and ask the first question. I, I, I was going to ask the very question that you picked up on at the end, uh, given the the limitations of HI are, are of, um, of of AI. Are are you convinced that we have nothing to fear from it other than its misuse by by our fellow humans? Yeah, that's a very good question, and and of course, one would be very um, it's very important to be careful about the possibilities of technology. I mean. I've seen the film, the Terminator films, and of course it was all happening and they were being eradicated by these machines when it was far too late. And and, and clearly we should always be um, trying to be as critical as we can of the, of the, of the, of these technologies in, in the sense of where they might be, they might lead in a very dangerous way. I can agree with some of the, you know, um, debate that's been going on in terms of how we should really be looking at the dangers um i don't see it personally in what these computer technologies are doing at the moment i don't really see any sense that they're somehow acquiring this general intelligence that that i think is absolutely key to not just human but also animal intelligence but of course as the technologies develop well we you'd have to keep looking at them and thinking well is something changed in, in what was happening there yeah um, that, that probably leads us quite neatly into um, into one of the questions that's been asked from the audience. Um, Jack asks, um, even if the argument that AI does not imitate human brains is correct, is it still possible that artificial intelligence can develop in its own direction um, and, and perhaps evolve in a way that makes it more powerful and perhaps dangerous? Yeah, I think that's a that's a that's an excellent question. It, it's it's it would be naive, I think, wouldn't it, to assume there's not ways, different ways to intelligence. Um, just because we have a biological brain, does that mean that you know a computer system cannot still manage to kind of create that meaning that I've talked about? I, I suppose I don't see it in any of the systems that are around at the moment. It, that sense that they are actually aware of what they're doing, and I think one important point to make is that. While it's true that these machine learning systems have been trained, and they are trained, I think that's an other important aspect of all this. They are being trained, for instance, to uh, you know write an essay in chat GPT or create these, I think, quite interesting art images, actually, sometimes, um, or beat a grand master at go. That is quite clear that in some spheres of, of, of human endeavor that they, they can actually outdo a human, if, you know, if it's chess or go in that sense. But I still don't get any sense that there's any sense in, of meaning in what they're doing in all this any self-awareness so i think that's one big difference and i think also when people have talk about this 
um, the idea there might somehow be a general intelligence will somehow emerge from this computer technology. I think an important point to make, unless I've misunderstood it, is that when you train them to do something like playing Go or write an essay, that, that, that then if you want to then get them to do something else, these machine learning systems, you've got to start from scratch and erase all that information and then do another problem thing that's different what's i think very different about human beings is our ability to do things you know so many different things and and even when it comes to something like riding a bike you know i ride a bike every day but you know you know this idea that you could just get on the bike and it all come back and you somehow know how to ride a bike even after years and i think you know the fact we can we can draw on memories we can draw on all sorts of things from the past and come up with ideas that we might not have thought about for, for for some time actually i think is the very big difference about the human brain and anything i can see in any of these ai systems yeah. and I, I suppose to some extent there's an element of unpredictability in that the that, that you're riding your bike you, know, you you've been doing it for years you can draw on the memory in in, in your brain and, and and the muscle memories that go with it but there's also that element of unpredictability about you know, how you'll react in particular circumstances there's a there's an interesting question from um from robin in the the chat saying that if um if, if you think about the use of AI in the same way as you would think about how you would manage an animal such as a dog, that you, you can train it and you can train it to do a great job. But there's always a little bit of unpredictability about how a human or an animal will react under particular circumstances. Is, is the same true of, of AI is the question is if, if you keep asking it to do the same thing, is there a predictability or a, a sort of hazard of unpredictability in there? Actually, I think there's some very kind of ne not positive, but also negative aspects of this. So in some ways, I think the unpredictability is the interesting bit, you know, just because this is a system that I don't think has any sense of what it's doing. That's not to say it can't create some quite interesting outcomes. So, and you know, some of the art that's emerging from these, uh, these AI systems, it can throw up all sorts of interesting new ways of, you know, of, of, of representing the world around us in a sense although i mean it's drawing on obviously all the data out there all the kind of images and which it's stealing and that's an important point of all this of course that these these systems in some ways are massively plagiarizing what what's there and there's some really important points made there about you know ownership and you know uh, that people have on those those images that have been used and i'm sure that as a tool i mean I, I was looking at a video the other day of someone who's used ai i mean he's a critic of ai but he's used ai to create a video with some really quite arresting images now it's him in a way that's in control of all this because he's selecting and using these images but he's using ai systems to do this um so i you know i think it's not implausible that as a tool as technology there's all sorts of creative ways that we can use these systems now in a negative way the unpredictability comes from these for instance, like self-driving cars, there was an article in the Guardian today saying that they've really the development of self-driving cars has, has really you know it's been a lot slower than than people uh, had, had, had predicted in, uh, originally a few years ago. And one of the reasons I think is that there have been claims, exaggerated claims, I believe, made about the safety of these cars, and yet there have been a series of you know high-profile accidents where clearly the, the 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 inability of the machine to you know not anticipate unexpected objects circumstances is a problem there was one of the first cases where a, a human being was was killed by one of these self-driving cars it was a, a pregnant woman in america who was um uh, elaine hertzberg i think the name was who was crossing a busy road uh pushing a, a bicycle with bags uh, shopping bags suspended from the handlebars maybe not the wisest thing to have done in the sense to be crossing such a busy road but the problem was that the self-driving car didn't recognize what is there in front of it the bags the bicycle somehow confused it thought it was originally a, a vehicle another vehicle that would somehow move out of the way and he ran her over and killed her and, and that was an example of where although it had been trained in many ways you know in, in all sorts of ways to recognize the run in front of it objects that bit of unpredictability uh, was what killed that that person so so i think that's the other the dangerous side obviously of our system just because they're not um aware and self-aware and have this kind of meaning creation that I talked about it doesn't mean they can't do some quite potentially disastrous things. And that's, I think, a big warning in terms of using, for instance, in warfare, for instance. Mm. Yeah. And it, it comes back to, um, I, I was fortunate enough to have a, a chat with John earlier in the week, but about how the, the, the human ability to read and interpret images is, is not matched 
in a in a meaningful sense or or a fully meaningful sense by by a lot of, of AI. And there's a there's a question in the chat from William saying is 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 this one of the issues that as as humans we talk of mind versus brain or software versus hardware? Is is AI just a brain but with no mind? Is you know is there no imagination um, possible within the the confines of artificial intelligence? I mean, I think personally, the, the fact that we have a biological brain and it's a product of millions, you could even argue billions of years of evolution, uh, because even some of the most basic elements of that brain, the, the neurotransmitters, the, 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 the iron channels that, that are part of how the brain works, they go back, back to the origins of life almost. What went back to you were, you know, the only, only uh, types of species on the planet. So, so I think that biological basis and... And that means that, you know, things like hormones, emotions, these are all a valid part of how the brain works. It's not really just about the circuitry. It's about that kind of chemical and biological composition to the brain. I, I think that's uh, something that would be difficult to mimic in a, in a machine. Now, as someone's argued earlier on, I was pointing out earlier on, that doesn't necessarily negate the idea that a, a machine system couldn't somehow produce you know produce something like a self-awareness but i do think we shouldn't ignore and neglect that the, the importance of that that biology and i think that's in a way why i would say my cat is much more set is much more intelligent and sentient than that than any computer system because for all that i've said about the importance of language and the way we interact with the world through, through technology and tools you know animals including our pets have a very sophisticated intelligence that's you know evolved essentially and allows them obviously to make sense of the world in a sense it might be unconscious in the sense they're not conceptualizing it but incredibly sophisticated we've interacting with the world and i think all of us who've you know got pets can see how sometimes they come up they do some quite interesting things really in terms of showing just how you know how uh, unpredictable they can be and yeah i think i think that's an important thing i, I we've still got to see with a machine definitely yeah. mm -hmm. um a couple of questions that are arising from that, both from the audience. Um, I think what one asking, um, how large and complex would a human comparable AI system need to be? Is is it the kind of thing that you could accommodate within a laptop, or or would it require a massive data center? Um, and another related question that you know, if the human brain relies upon billions of nerves, billions and billions of combinations of connections. Is it just unreasonable to assume that a computer can ever have the capacity um, to to emulate that complexity, however big it is? I, I think we underestimate the complexity of our brains in some ways because I mean clearly there's a massive complexity just in terms of the different types of neurons and their connections. We're talking about you know hundreds of billions of I can't remember what the, the figure is now, but it, it's it's massive. It, we, essentially, our brains are the most complex object in the known universe maybe there's aliens out there with bigger brains but but we don't know about them at this point um but it's not just that is it because as i said earlier on there are the glial cells there are the brain waves of different frequencies all add to the complexity i mean it's very different difficult to think of the brain in a kind of digital way so how you would if it's not a digital system then i think it's going to be very difficult to mimic with, with a machine now one of the things that could be interesting in the future in a completely sci-fi and off the wall kind of way is that with new technology in terms of stem cells so there's now ways for instance to take a human stem cell or it could be a skin cell taken from a person then you can treat them in ways that make them then able to give rise to different cell types in the body and they've been then infusing 3d matrices with these with with, with these stem cells and then with a combination of different chemicals for different tissues they've been able to get what they call organoids so you've got intestine organoids, one that looks a bit like an eye. I mean, they are approximations of organs, even brain organoids that do have many of the cell types and also the, even some of the structure of the human brain. Now, at the moment, these are on an embryonic scale and the problem is they don't have a blood supply and without that, it's going to be difficult for them to grow past a certain size. They're difficult, maybe it's not a good thing anyway. But, but what's interesting with that technology is that the way it's developing, it's not completely implausible that you couldn't grow a human brain in a vat. And of course, there was that... There's a very famous philosophical question: What would it feel like to be a, you know, a brain in a vat? If you would you ever would you have consciousness? That kind of thing. Um, the fact we can talk about these as a possibility rather than some really, you know, philosophical problem just shows how fast 
some of our uh, scientific uh, you know, biotechnology is developing. Now, that would pose a question, wouldn't it? If you were to grow a brain in a vat and it was an adult, you know, it's like a full-size brain, and you had inputs and, and you know, the bit, you could have like a, an artificial eye or, 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 or you could even like Blade Runner, you know, the film where they've actually got these androids, which are essentially assembled from, from, from human parts, all grown from stem cells. Would that have this you know, consciousness like a human consciousness? I suspect it would be very unethical to even pursue some of these, these kind of angles. But I think that's a more meaningful way we might create consciousness artificially than, than trying to do it to say a computer system. Of course, what was it in Blade Runner? I mean, they had superhuman um, characters, didn't they? they? Were super strong and they could run very fast, that kind of thing. So, of course, there's all sorts of possible things that might be done with with, with, the, with the biology of such an android. That you kind of, uh, it, it wouldn't be a, a machine-based android as much as one that was based on, on on biology. But maybe with you know robot implants, robotic implants, all sorts of things, you could create a superhuman person. I, I suspect that the ethics of all this is means that we don't really necessarily want to do all this but but the fact we can we, we could we're talking about it i think it shows how far things have come on in the ability to kind of create artificial beings and that's to me a much more real possibility than than, than a computer that that learns to think yeah and, and i think the connection you're drawing between our sense of our, our consciousness and, and the concerns about the ethics involved in interfering with or changing human thought processes is a, is a point that will, will probably resonate um, at, at, at the risk of bringing this back to the uh, the, the ineffable mind of cats um, a question from the audience uh, about your views on animal um, um, consciousness and, and the um, particularly um, our audience member Richard has started reading Mark Solomon's The Hidden Spring um, and is, is thinking aloud about his view on the source of consciousness and the extent to which it can be attributed to, to animals or acquired by animals. Yeah, fascinating point. I mean, I mean, in my latest book, I think I've changed my view to some extent on, on when I, because in, in Mind Shift, I think I was, I mean, definitely arguing what I've been arguing today, which is that language gives us conceptual thinking in a way that animals simply don't have we need those concepts those words to you know be able to express things like past present and future and of course anything around us in a in a kind of conceptual way we often take for granted our conceptual thinking i still maintain that animals there's no other species that has that kind of conceptual ability based on language but i think the more we're learning about for instance you know non-human primates they have some very sophisticated uh, ability to you know view the other primates in their group and, and i think there's a sort of pre-language kind of conceptual thinking that maybe is there and of course in a way that also forms the basis for the way we were able to make that jump you know in evolution um and of course that, that let, it's an important point in thinking then about them as as as, as, as in beings that we have interactions with i mean as a as a biologist, uh, we, we do, you know, we have worked on animals. We have used animals to study all sorts of aspects of how the body works from cancer to, you know, diabetes to, 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 to fertility. And I would maintain that's an important aspect of, of, of our work. But of course, it raises issues about the welfare of animals, the ethics of, of working with animals. And one of my other interests is in gene editing. My, my, my second book was all about the new technology of gene editing. And of course, that throws up all sorts of ethical dilemmas in a sense in that the more we're able to manipulate the genomes of other species we've got to think about where that's all leading because for instance there are scientists in china who are, at the moment we're just starting to identify some of the genes that make us human i mean there are there is a, a gene called notch 2l that seems to be part of the the way that our uh, responsible for the way that our brains have got to the size they are if you uh, it seems that one of the reasons why our brains have, have developed this 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 to this size this kind of threefold extra size that they've got is is a, is a slight change in the way that stem cells in the brain then start to develop and you know there are people people in um in particularly in china it's not just in china but because there's a lot of work going on in in, in terms of uh, non-human primate gene editing there there has been talk about, you know, taking some of those genes that make us more, that seem to be part of being human, and then put, you know, put them in into a in, into a primate and see what happens. Which interesting, certainly one of the ways to really kind of start to get at the biological base of what it means to be human. But of course, that raises all sorts of issues. Anyone seen the Planet of the Ape, Ape films? No, it can go all go badly wrong, that kind of thing. And I suspect it would be very difficult to take, you know, one single gene and change that. And that would lead to, you know, talking ape and, and so on and so forth. But, but but the fact we can even start to think about 
that happening as a possibility, again, shows some of the ethical dilemmas that emerge from uh, not just the work we do with computers, but also on the biological front. Mm. And there's uh, I think an interesting follow up to that and the broader question of consciousness that um, David has posed in, in the chat, not, not just about consciousness and interpretation, but about human motivation and, and the extent to, to which motivation and reasoning um, are at the service of, of human biological desires that we, we set off in the pursuit of warmth or food um, or success or, 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 or whatever we think is to our benefit. Um, and David's question is, is whether there's a relationship between the possibility of a general intelligence and the risk that, that AI might somehow become equally self-motivated in the pursuit of, of its own good or benefit. Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously is a fear, isn't it, that, that the computers, if they were able to achieve this 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 self awareness, might then start to think, well, you know, and I guess you really need robotic systems as well, uh, might start to think, well, we want to run the world in our kind of benefit, you know, and and cast aside the humans. I mean, certainly that was the premise of the Terminator films, where it starts off with a super powerful. Um, weapon system that then becomes self-aware and ends up just destroying the human race um so yeah i, I think it's that it would be a, a concern actually well two types of concerns in a way whether we're talking about computer technology or, or gene editing of say primates is that we got to think about the welfare of those systems. If it was really true, we could create some self-aware computer system. We'd have to think about whether that has rights, all these things that I would throw up. But equally, it might be the decide those systems decide, well, they want you know a share of, of what's going on in the world. And, and that could work in a in a bad way, not just the Terminator films, Planet of the Apes. Obviously, in that sense, in those films, it's where the the kind of the uh the system we've created then ends up uh turning against us. Um so lots of lots of potential concerns there, uh, why, which is why I think we're right to be to be certainly careful and, and cautious about the kind of things we're creating. I just personally don't think there's that kind of sense of self awareness on the horizon. Who knows? Maybe yeah. in the future. Is is there a, a a boundary, however permeable it might be, between? self-awareness and and the very distant possibility that machines develop it and consciousness what's what what's the difference in the terminology there i mean i mean certainly as a scientist i'm um i'm excited by new technologies new developments it, it excites me that we can do so much more with computers than you know a few decades ago it excites me that for the first time in history we've got the ability to precisely edit any perhaps any living cell. I mean, the fact we can now they do this to a human embryo raises all sorts of ethical issues because while it could be used, that technology could be used to learn more about how the uh, the human embryo develops and is being used in research, careful research to do that. There was the case of a scientist, uh, Jiang, uh, Dr. He, in, in, a, in a lab in China who decided he was going to implant, gene edit human embryos and implant them into, a, into the mother. And they're now born and, you know, they're, some years old now and, and growing up and, and that was done unethically illegally but it happened you know so so i think we've got to be um absolutely clear that we should be having a massive debate about the the direction of these technologies mm -hmm. scientists like to mess around they like to fiddle they like to push the boundaries you know there are scientists in cambridge at the moment who are almost challenging the view of what it means to be human being by taking human stem cells putting them together they form an embryo it's not implausible that in the future you could create a person from stem cells there'd be no sperm and egg there'd be no mother or father there'd, there'd be you know the technology is almost there to do that and of course all these the ability to do something doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it but scientists do like to push the boundaries and maybe that's why we need lots of other people to be involved in debate about this because it shouldn't really be just left to scientists. And of course that applies to AI as well. And in that sense, it's a quite right that we should be having this debate about the wisdom of what's happening in terms of developing these machine learning systems without a doubt, yeah. yeah. There's a huge complexity to the discussions that, that range from consciousness to morality, to understanding, to awareness, and, and, and to all the, the issues that the, the audience has raised this evening. Um, Julia has asked a slightly more pragmatic question, which will resonate with those of us who, who read and research and, and write for a living, um, asking where you stand on the question of authorship when using an AI system, does ownership remain with the person who asked the question? 
or does the machine providing the answer or whoever trained the system to begin with um, have ownership of the of the output? And I, I think you hinted a bit at this issue in the in the lecture, but uh, be interested to hear your thoughts. Could, yeah, could, could AI write your book on consciousness for you? That's a really important question because, of course, one could argue that you know some of the biggest the people who are talking most about the threat of existential threat of AI to, to human uh, civilization, uh, they're often the people who are actually involved in developing these AI systems. Uh, and one wonders a little bit about whether that's a bit of a smoke screen for some of the things that are actually going on, which is that these uh, machine learning systems are pulling to you know from from the internet all sorts of images text and, and that kind of thing and, and i think people quite rightly are appalled at the way this is happening without giving you know proper credit to the people who create the images the, the text in the first place i mean i, what, I think one of the, the the reasons for the the strike in hollywood uh, has been this 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 appropriation of people's labor essentially mm -hmm. so i think absolutely we should be uh, we should be criticizing this we should be saying this you know there should be some some payback if, if someone's created a, a piece of art or, or a text that's not just you know, should be just there for someone to then appropriate and plagiarize. So although there may be a creative aspect to what these systems can produce, absolutely there should be proper um, acknowledgement of where those sources come from. And I think that becomes then a big issue in terms of also some of the ways that AI systems might start to appropriate jobs. You know, I'm not sure whether, you know, there will be a computer system that can mark an essay in the way I could or write a book on consciousness, but I'd be certainly... Um, concerned about the way that that might um, challenge you know all sorts of professions jobs i'm giving a talk a bit similar to this talk tomorrow to the uh, general uh, i think it's the general medical council to doctors and of course there's lots of implications there for the way that ai systems might impact on medicine in, in a good way but also potentially challenging what we mean by a doctor and all those kind of things so yeah we shouldn't take this lightly don't, if just because a system's not self-aware doesn't mean that it's not a threat in, in, in all sorts of other ways. I mean, the Luddites are often seen as a kind of negative uh, set of people in the 19th century. But I think they had a point, you know, their, their livelihoods have been taken away by these new uh, factory systems. And they were right to be protesting and, and trying to do something about that. Ultimately, of course, it was a lost cause, you know, but but it, it's, it's right to be concerned about the ways that these, these AI systems might have a negative impact on human uh, conditions, human pay, all, all these things at work. Um, John, that's been absolutely tremendous. I, I, I think the, 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 the lively questions and the sheer range of questions being asked is, is testament to the, to the energy and the breadth of, of your lecture. So thank you very much. And um, is there anything you want to say to wrap up? No, just it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Whenever I talk about this subject, well, whether consciousness or this particular subject, I, I, I think it's always interesting, the kind of range of questions and points that are made. And it's been absolutely fascinating to hear what people wanted to ask and what I had to say and, and really enjoyed it. Yeah, so thank you very much to all of the audience. Right, well, th thank you, John. Um, so someone said to me a few weeks back that, that AI is, is probably a good place to start and a bad place to end. And I think what you've demonstrated is that there are some serious conversations to have ahead of us. You know, you've started the ball rolling, but, but all kinds of, of questions and, and issues that will fuel discussions for, uh, for a long time yet, I'm, I'm sure. So and on, on behalf of um, the audience on screen, um, thank you very much for your time this evening um, for, for such a brilliant lecture and accessible lecture to, to a very mixed audience um, and for handling the questions with such care and, and attention. Um, I'd like to thank our audience also for attending um, as well as thanking John for, for speaking this evening. And um, if this has whetted your appetite for the Worcester College online lecture series, um, our next lecture is on the 28th of February. Um, and will be given by Dr. Michael Drolley with the title, um, What is the Circular Economy or Nature's Agricultural Revolution? Um, the event on that occasion will be hosted by Patricia um, Clavin. Um, just a quick note for old members who are based in the US um, from our development office, um, Worcester College Provost David Isaac um, will be in the US um, in the spring and there'll be an opportunity to meet with him in New York in March. So invitations will go out soon. Do take advantage if you can. Um, but apart from that, thank you once again to, to John for such a tremendous evening and very best wishes 
from everyone in college for a happy, happy holiday season um, when it arrives. But many thanks and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>